31, welcome to example four. So we're gonna take a look at a quadratic function, but I wanna focus on how to find the maximum or minimum value. And when you're talking about a quadratic and you want the higher low point, that's fancy speak for find me the vertex, All right? Because if it's a parabola, the vertex is either the high or the low, depending on whether your parabola opens up or down. And even though I haven't read example four, you can see that the lead coefficient is negative. So you're gonna have an upside down parabola, which means we're gonna have a max. We're gonna have a high point and that's called the vertex. All right, so what's gonna happen in example four is I'm gonna do as much of this as I can without using the graphing part of my graphing calculator. I'm gonna to flip to my computer to show you all of that. I wanna do as much as I can of this problem by hand and then in just the calculation screen of my graphing calculator. And then I'm gonna to flip to my computer and show you how your calculator can really help you with every single part of this. It's just we need to know the right buttons to push. All right, so here we go. A ball is projected directly upward from an initial height of 75 feet with an initial velocity of 112 feet per second. The ball's height can be modeled by the equation, and here's the quadratic model. All right, so I want you to notice a couple things, right? You see it had an initial height of 75 feet, and there it is in the y-intercept. All right, and you see that it has this rate, this slope, if you will, because of the PER, right? It's something, is, or the velocity is changing at 112 feet per second, and it pops up in that linear term. And I say linear term because this is the quadratic term, this is the linear term, this is the constant. And that's true for all projectile um, formulas, that you have this negative 16 t squared here if you're dealing with feet. This will always be your initial velocity and this will always be your initial height. All right, and it's important to take note that this velocity was positive because we were throwing the ball upward. And the reason that this initial height was positive is because the building was above ground. Okay, so there we go. We've got time as our independent value, or excuse me, our independent variable. And then we've got height as the dependent variable. So we input time, we get height back out. We input seconds, we get feet back out. All right, so let's see if we can answer part A together. It says, after how many seconds does the ball reach its maximum height? And then what is the maximum height? Okay, well, if you have a quadratic function, which you do, you have a parabola. If we ever wanna find the max height, the max or min, we're gonna find the vertex. And we've talked previously about that the vertex, at least the x coordinate of it, follows the formula negative b over 2a. Now I know I said x coordinate and I wrote t, and that's because we're not using x's right now, we're using t's. So I want us to start to feel problems, feel out what it's like to not necessarily use x and y. Here we're gonna use t and h. Still legit, just using different letters. All right, so for this problem, it looks like a is equal to negative 16, b is equal to 112, and c is equal to 75. So as I start to work this, negative b would be negative 112 divided by two times negative 16. Let's see what that number is equal to. So I'm looking, oops, let me go back home. Negative 112 divided by, in parentheses, two times negative 16. Oops, I have two minus, that's a problem. Let me change this to times. There we go and it looks like I'm at 3.5. And I do want you to take note that I put the denominator in parentheses. If you did it without parentheses, you're going to get a different number, right? So you wanna be careful, right? It's not 896, it's 3.5. The, the problem here is it takes 112, divides it by two, and then multiplies the entire thing by 16, excuse me, negative 16, and you still want to divide that negative 16. All right, so ultimately, I know that this is 3.5. If I want to find the maximum height value, let's plug 3.5 in for t and see what we get back out. So I'm going to have negative 16 times 3.5 squared plus 112 times 3.5 plus 75. Let's see what we get back out from this function. Now I'm going to use my store function here. If you remember my store function, we talked about it a while ago. It's this STO, it's that button above the on key. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do 3.5 
and you can't see it right now, but I'm gonna hit the STO key in just a moment, and as soon as I do, a little arrow is gonna pop up. I'm gonna store that into my X variable. So now I'm gonna hit my, my variable key of X, and then my calculator will just remember that number, that the X has got the number 3.5 associated with it. So I need to do negative 16 X squared, plus 112 X, plus 75, and what am I getting back out? It looks like 271. And you could have typed this in directly. All right, you still would have gotten 271. It's just I'm lazy. And you can see I have to enter a 3.5 here and a 3.5 here, so I had to enter it twice. I didn't want to. I just wanted to enter it once and use the X button. So I'm not saving myself a ton of time, but it's just something I use pretty frequently. I like to use the store function. So we've got 271 here. Okay, I wanna think about the units on each of these. This is a time, uh, time number, right? And the time units here were seconds. Right? This is a height, this represents a height. So the height of this was 271 feet. So in terms of answering this question, after how many seconds does the ball reach its maximum height? Well, here we go. Yes, I'm using a sentence. Get ready. The ball reaches its maximum height at 3.5 seconds. All right, what is the maximum height? The maximum height is 271 feet. Okay, so part A, it's asking us basically to find the vertex, but it's just being framed in a slightly different way. What was the max height? Well, max height on a quadratic means find the vertex. All right. I'm going to scooch this up. Let's try and take a look at part B. So part B is saying, after how many seconds will the ball reach the ground? All right, if the ball is going to reach the ground, this is trying to imply to you that h of t is equal to zero. Because if your ball is on the ground, the height of the ball is zero. So with that, what I'm really trying to solve here is when is negative 16t squared plus 112t plus 75 equal to zero? Well, you have three ways to solve this, right? We can factor, we can complete the square, or we can use the quadratic formula. I'm gonna opt to use the quadratic formula here, all right? So I'm gonna erase my three options just to give myself some room. And let's figure out what A, B, and C are, and we will get rolling with this. All right, so in this problem, I know what A is equal to negative 16, B is equal to 112, C is equal to 75. Here we go. This time T will be equal to negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4 times A times C all over 2a. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. This would be negative 112 plus or minus, let's see what that discriminant is equal to. I know my denominator is going to be negative 32. Alright, so we're going to have 112 squared minus 4 times negative 16 times 75, whew, my goodness, 17,344. Okay, let's see what these two values would be. I'm definitely gonna need my calculator for this. Okay, so I need to do initially, let me clear this out, negative 112 plus the square root of 17,344 and then I want to divide that by negative 32. It looks like I have about negative 0.616 as one of my zeros. Oops, let me write that that was negative. That will become important. All right, 
And then we're going to have, what, negative 112, I think. Let me just redo this. Minus that. And then I'm going to divide that by negative 32. And I'm looking at seven, positive 7.616. All right, so let's take a look at our two answers. It says, after how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? Well, is it negative 0.616 seconds or is it positive 7.6 seconds? And I think you'll give me that this is an impossible answer. And it's impossible in terms of the, being the answer to our question because time has to be positive, okay? Since T represents time, and we need a positive answer, this can't be our solution. All right, and this happens all the time where we put a model on a situation, right? We have a quadratic model for this, this problem, and the numerical answer isn't actually something that can play out in the real world. Happens all the time. Real world is always super messy. So we have theory, and then we have what actually happens in the real world. But this is a totally legit answer. I, and I could, that makes sense to me that the ball will reach the ground in about 7.16, excuse me, 7.616 seconds. So after how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? All right, sentence time again, right? The ball will reach the ground in 7.616 seconds. Okay. All right, so let's move on to part C. Part C is probably the most intricate of all of them. All right, so we're gonna spend some time on part C. All right, here we go. So we've got that in view. Now this says, for what interval of time is the height greater than 200 feet? So I want you to imagine we're throwing this ball up in the air, right? It's going to hit, go all the way up, and we know it's going to go all the way to 271 feet, right? We found that out in part A. It goes up to 271 feet. So in that time that it's traveling up to 271 feet, it has to pass 200, right? It goes above it, and then it comes below it. And we're trying to figure out what are those two time values? Between what two units of time, between what interval of time is that height of the ball greater than 200 feet? Well, let's figure this out. This is telling you that you would like to find out when h of t is greater than 200. All right, so when I wanna find out when h of t is greater than 200, the first thing you wanna do is start with, well, when is the height equal to 200? So let's start with when is the height equal to 200? And then we'll begin to address when it's greater than 200. So if I start here, this will say, well, when is negative 16 t squared plus 112 t plus 75 equal to 200. Now again, I can use the quadratic formula, I could factor, I could complete the square, but I'm gonna to opt to use the quadratic formula. This will be negative 16 t squared plus 112 t minus 275 should be equal to zero, okay? Actually, I think I, I copied something wrong. Just taking a look up top, this should have been a plus sign I apologize, and then when I subtract 200, I think I'm actually looking at negative 125. Ooh, glad I caught that now before I did the quadratic formula, yikes. Okay, so those look like the correct numbers. All right, so here we go. For this one, I have what A is negative 16, B is 112, but this time out C is negative 125. So let's see what kind of answers we're gonna get from this. So T would be equal to negative B, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four times a times c all over two a. All right, let me see what's in that discriminant and we'll simplify this a little bit. So I'm looking at negative 112 plus or minus the square root of something over negative 32. All right, so let's see what that discriminant is this time out. So we would have 100, oops, turned off. Let me clear this out. 112 squared minus four times negative 16 times negative 125. This time we're looking at a smaller number. It looks like 
4544. All right, let's see what two numbers we're going to get out of this. Okay, so we should do negative 112 plus the square root of 4544. And I want to divide that by negative 32. It looks like one of my answers is positive 1.393. Okay, let's repeat this and do the opposite. Let's do the subtracted version. And I want to divide that one by negative 32, and I am getting positive 5.607. Okay, so with that, I'm going to give you your first example of something called a sign pattern. All right, and, and I'll explain as I go what the sign pattern is referencing. But before we get into that, I want you to visualize this parabola again, right? It's going up. I'm going to draw a really like super sketchy graph and then I'm going to erase it, right? So we know it hits 200 and then 271. So you're with me that this parabola starts at around 75 feet off the ground. This is not to scale, by the way, right? It heads up and then it comes back down, right? And we know it hits the ground at around what did we say it hits the ground at around 7.616 seconds? But somewhere in here, it's above 200. And we know this number is 1.393. And we know this number over here is 5.607. And again, this is not drawn to scale. I'm just sketching this out. So I think you can give me, or that you can visually see, this ball is above that 200 line between 1.393 and 5.607. Because from 5.607 to 7.6, right, it's coming at the, the height of 200 down to the ground. And between 0 and 1.393, it was climbing from that initial height of 75 feet up to 200. And in this middle interval is when it's above that 200 foot mark. Okay? So in a moment, I'm going to say that the height of the ball is greater than 200 feet between 1.393 and 5.607. That's going to be my, my end game. But I want to make a sign pattern for you. And what that's going to entail is shrinking this down to just the x-axis and doing a visual of what's going on. Okay? So go with me for a moment. And I'm going to make these sign patterns only because if you are going on in math, if you're going into calculus, they're going to have you make sign patterns. It's a pretty standard thing that we do. So imagine taking that parabola and just shrinking it down to an x-axis, or in this case, the t-axis. So here's a sign pattern. All right. Make a horizontal line. Okay. Actually, I'm going to just make it a, oh, that's fine. I was going to maybe move it up just a smidge, but I think we can see it. All right, so I want you to imagine this is the t-axis, okay? Or at least we'll represent the underside as the t-axis. All right, so I'm going to put 1.393 here, and I'm going to put 5.607 here, all right? So I want you to imagine the t-values go below this axis, and the h of t-values go above, all right? So let me start to show you how to work these sign patterns. All right, so what happens is on the bottom, you put where your function zeroed out, right? Or in this case, where our function was 200, but where this equation zeroed out, and it zeroed out at 1.393 and 5.607. So when t was equal to 5.607, this, this value here was zero, okay? Actually, technically, I shouldn't write this as h, because it's not our original height function. All right, I, I set the height to 200, so this is technically when h is equal to 200. All right, and when t was 1.393, this was zero. All right, now if you remember when we graphed, made that little sketch, right? Let's talk about what was happening there. All right, when you were to the left of 1.393, we would put a minus sign here because our function was below that 200 foot mark, or it's another way of saying this function here was negative, it was below zero. All right, and then our function went above the 200 foot mark, or you could say this function here was positive. All right, and then it went below that 200 foot mark, 
And again, or you could say this function here was negative. And really, all I'm looking for is what interval was this thing above that 200 foot marker? Or another way of saying it is when is this adjusted equation positive? And we would say that was between 1.393 and 5.607. And I don't want you to get too caught up in how I got all of these just yet. I want you to just remember how the graph connects, right? That we were below, above, below, and I represented that with minus, plus, minus, okay? All right, so with that, I'm gonna flip over to my computer and we're gonna take a look at how your calculator, and I know I have used my calculator, but how your calculator's graph screen, right? I haven't used any of the y equals or graphs yet. How this can actually do all of parts A, B, and C for you. And you might be thinking, sweet, my calculator can get the answer for me. Yes, it can get the answer for you, that's awesome, but I'm still gonna wanna see the work. It's just a great option that you have and that your calculator can check all of your numbers for you. All right, so let's flip over to my computer and I'll see you in a bit and we're gonna talk about A, B, and C again. All right, I'll talk to you in a bit, bye. Hey, Mount 31, let's take a look at example four with our calculators this time out. So we had talked about after how many seconds does the ball reach its maximum height? Well, you have a, a function on your calculator that will let you find maxes and mins. Um, it's nice with parabolas because there's either one max or one min. When we move on in, in this course, when we get to higher degree polynomials like cubics and quartics, there's multiple maxes and mins. So we have to find multiple points at for points per problem. It's nice with parabolas because there's only one max or min. All right, so I hit my y equals. Now taking a look at it, I can see I have a plot on. So I must have been doing a stats problem the last time I was on my computer. If I want to turn that plot off, and it's a good idea to turn that plot off because I'm not doing any stats problems. I don't have any data. I can go up until I see plot one actually flashing with the black background. And if I hit enter, I just turn it off. Okay, so with that, let's enter in our function. It looks like it's negative 16x squared. Oops, somehow I got out of that screen. Here we go. Negative 16x squared plus 112x plus 75. All right, so we've got that in there. Now your calculator doesn't have a t variable, which is fine. We'll just use the x's, no biggie there. Um, oh gosh, the sun is like in my eyes. You can kind of see it here. Oh well, um, I'll just try and not look at the sun. Um, so let's do what its maximum height is. Let me go ahead and hit zoom six. All right, uh, zoom six. And let's see what we have here. Now, I, I know it's gonna be an upside down parabola and I can't see the top of it right now. So let me adjust my window. Since I can see both X intercepts, I don't need to adjust my X axis, but I can't see up down high enough, specifically up high enough. So I definitely wanna adjust my Y maximum. So I'm gonna try and do negative 100 to 100. And I'm gonna make a tick mark every 10 units. Let's see, that's not quite high enough. So let me go ahead and then what I would do is I would tack on another zero. I'd go to a thousand and then a thousand and I would make tick marks every hundred units. And let's see, that should be enough to catch it. Now that is actually way too much. So as I look at it, I didn't need a thousand. Like that was ridiculously high. It looks like super high. Did I do negative 10,000? Oh yeah. Like I just don't need all of that room. Sorry, what I meant to do here was initially negative 1,000 to 1,000. That looks a little better, sorry. Then I could see that this got up to about 100, 200, 300. So I can tell I don't really need anything much past. I'll go 400 here. And then I'll just do negative 100 on the bottom. And then I'll look for tick marks of like every 50 units. So there's me fishing for a window. It takes a little bit of time, but I can finally see it. Okay, I'm going to clear out all of this key press history because I don't want it. Okay, so here we go. If I had to guess, just counting, that looks like the high point. 
If I had to guess, I think that's at one, two, three, four, somewhere between four and five, or maybe around five, if I'm just guessing. But I don't have to guess, my calculator will do it for me. So we're gonna hit second, and we're gonna hit the trace button, and that'll call up your calculation screen. So we can find values, zeros, mins, maxes, and we've done a few of these before, but let's go do option four. Let's do the maximum. All right, so there's a couple of ways to do this, just depending on what you prefer. I personally like to enter in numbers into here. So I think the max is somewhere around an X coordinate of five-ish. So I just need any number to the left of that max and any number to the right of that max. And it doesn't matter what they are, I just need X coordinates to the left of it. So if you can imagine if I had an X axis at five, well a number to the left of five, I could pick zero, okay? And I could hit enter. You also could have picked one, two, 3.7, I just picked zero, all right? And then I could go to the right and I say, well, nine is to the right of zero, oh, excuse me, nine is to the right of five, which is where I think my max is. And I could put in a guess if I wanted, or I could just hit enter. I usually just hit enter because I'm lazy, but if you want to guess five, you can. If I hit enter, there's my maximum. Oh, and I was actually a little bit off, right? I thought it was between four and five. It looks like it was 3.5. And then I knew that height was 271. Okay, great. So I had a, a little bit of a wonky guess. Now you don't have to use zero and nine like I did. I could use any numbers I wanted. So if I hit second, oops, not second and table, sorry, second and trace, and did option four again, well, I could pick, let's see, I could pick two and I could pick seven. That's a number to the left. That's a number to the right. Hit enter through guess. And there I am, 3.5, 271. And you see your calculator's having just a few issues rounding. Okay, it happens. Um, the other option you have is you can do this maximum and then you can move your blinker, right? So I just need to get to the left of my max. That's to the left, I'll hit enter. And then use my right arrow key. Click as many times as you need to go to the right of your max and hit enter, and you can see my, my graph, or my calculator is gonna find me the maximum point between these two X coordinates. And if I hit enter, there we go, 3.5, 271. All right, now, after how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? Here, I'm looking for something different. I want to figure out when is the ball gonna hit the ground? There's an X coordinate, there's an X coordinate. Now, let me go ahead and clear this out, all right? now. We had talked about how I don't want the negative x coordinate because time can't be negative. All right, if, if this was any other problem that didn't have time as its x variable, I could go after this x coordinate and I'll show you that in just a little bit, just so we have it. But if I'm counting here, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So if I look at it, it really looks to me like my x coordinate is between seven and eight. So that's an x value to the left of my zero and an x value to the right of my zero. So if I hit second and trace again, and you look at option two, it says zero. And another word for zero is x-intercepts. So let's go ahead and look for the x-intercept. Now, what was my left bound? I had an x-intercept of seven, or an x, I should say, a left bound of seven. Right bound would have been eight, so eight and enter. And my calculator is gonna find me the x-intercept, or the zero, between the x coordinate of seven and the x coordinate of eight, you can hit enter through guess. And there we go, we've got 7.616, which we found with the quadratic formula when we were doing it by hand. Now, just for fun, if you wanted to do, if you wanted to find the second one, all right, let me hit second trace option two. Now I could guess, it looks to me like this x axis, or this zero is between an x coordinate of negative one and zero. So I could type negative one, enter for my left and negative, or excuse me, and zero, enter for my right. So I could do negative one, enter, left, zero, enter for my right, and hit enter through guess, and there's that, that x-intercept. Or again, you could use your little blinky. I can move to the left of my x-coordinate, or excuse me, the left of my x-intercept, hit enter. Use my right arrow key, move to the right, of my x-intercept, hit enter, and then hit enter through guess. And there, there's the second ordered pair that we saw when we were um, using the quadratic formula. One thing I do want to mention, 
that when it comes to, let's say this, this x-intercept, we chose seven and eight over here. Let me do a different option here. So let's say instead of seven and eight, I chose, let's see, what is this? One, two, three, three and nine. So three, enter, nine, enter, right? I picked three was to the left of it, nine was to the right of it, hit enter through guess. I'm still getting 7.616. And if you see this negative 2 times 10 to the negative 11, that basically is 0 because it's negative 2 with 0, excuse me, with 11 zeros in front of it because that's your calculator's way of writing scientific notation. So it's basically 0. But I want, I want to reiterate, I put 3 and 9. You can almost put anything in there, but you need to be a little bit careful. You can't go so far to the left that you pick something like negative 2. Right? Negative 2 is too far to the left in terms of a left bound because it crosses through the other zero and then your calculator gets confused. It's not sure which one you're, you're looking for. So if I were to hit second trace and zero and do something like negative two to nine, then your calculator is not sure which of these two you want because you picked an interval that included both of them. If I hit enter, it happened to get this one, but what if you wanted that one? So you wanna be careful with how far you go left and right. I try and stay relatively close. All right, so we got that one. Now, what's awesome about this for the, the ball, the, what time interval is the ball greater than 200 feet? This is great, it'll help you. I mean, I showed you that sign pattern technique, which again, sign patterns will pop up a little bit later in calc, but if you wanna talk about 200 feet, that is a Y value, that is a height value. So let's go plug that into Y sub two and type in 200, all right? Now I can see that this 200, that line 200 intersects my parabola, my height parabola at two different points. If I wanted to count, if I try and drag my mouse down, it looks like that first intersection point is somewhere between x equaling one and x equaling two. And this one, if I drag this down, what is that, one, two, three, four, five, it looks like it's somewhere around six. So I think I have two intersection points somewhere around two and somewhere around six-ish. Those are my guesses. So let's use our calculation screen again. So we're gonna do second and calc. This time we're gonna go with option five, all right? So here's how this works. It's gonna prompt you, right? Your calculator is gonna say, which two curves would you like to check for intersection points? And the reason it's gonna ask you this, you're gonna see me say, or it's gonna prompt first curve, second curve is because now you stay here on your calculation screen, just hold tight as I, I move somewhere else. For, for this problem, the way I have it set up, I only have two functions in here, but you're allowed to write up to 10 functions. So this calculator interface is initially asking you which of the 10 functions would you like to see intersection points for? So if I hit second trace and then five, would I like one of my curves to be the parabola? Yes, I would, so I'm gonna hit enter. Would I like the other curve to be the line y equaling 200? Yes, I would. So I'm gonna hit enter. I only have two curves. So by default, my calculator is gonna pick those, all right? But if you had three, you'd have to select two out of the three. If you had seven, you'd have to select two out of the seven. All right, your calculator is happy to find both points, but it can only find one at a time. I wanna find this first one, which I thought was kind of close to x equaling two. So I'm gonna guess two. If I hit enter, my calculator will say, hey, it wasn't quite two, it was 1.393. All right, and let's run it again. My, my next guess will be at six. So I'm gonna hit second, calc, option five. Again, do I want one of my curves to be my parabola? Yes, I do, hit enter. Do I want the next curve to be my line? Yes, I do, so I'm gonna hit enter. And this time I wanna guess and I have a guess for about x equaling six. So you can actually type in six, that's fine if you wanna type in six, or if you would prefer, you can use your right arrow key. Oops, actually it's not gonna let me right now because I already typed the six in. Let me go ahead and just hit enter. That was my second guess, x equaling six. And my calculator will say, no, it was actually 5.607. What I was gonna say before is if you want, you can use your arrows. So I can go enter, enter, and then I can move my arrows closer or further away from one of the intersection points. So if I moved it over here and hit enter, it would get me the lower intersection value. If I hit second trace five, enter, enter, 
moved it over here then hit enter so that blinky was closer to the second intersection point hit enter there's my second intersection point for me personally you'll hear me repeat this all the time i'm lazy so i don't like doing um as many, like i like to just narrow down or like dial down the number of buttons i have to hit so that's why i prefer to just say second trace five enter enter okay i want the one closer to two right? it's just fewer buttons for me to have to hit all right so with that i know that's a lot of calculator commands but it's good to know how your calculator works so that you can um, have your calculator check your work for you right so we've got all of that algebra being matched with what we found on our graphing calculator. All right, so with that, we're gonna try some word problems next. Yay, all right, thanks gang, I'll see you in a bit, bye.